Olá, muito boa tarde a todas as pessoas presentes. Obrigada por terem vindo, mesmo numa tarde de sol. Eu vou fazer uma breve introdução em português e depois passamos para inglês para entrar em diálogo com os convidados. Um, este é o primeiro de uma série de eventos uh, paralelos à exposição Cidadãos do Cosmos, de Anton Vidocq, que inaugurou na passada quinta-feira na Rampa, em coprodução com o Sears Art Center. Uh, este projeto é financiado pelo Criatório da Câmara Municipal de Porto uh, e a Rampa é, um, tem o apoio da, da Direção-Geral das Artes. Uh, e este projeto ainda também tem o apoio da Fundação Luz Americana. A exposição Cidadão do Cosmos apresenta quatro filmes de Anton Vidocq que exploram o cosmismo russo e abordam temas relacionados com a biopolítica, o universalismo, a utopia, a revolução e a museologia, Uh, propondo dispositivos cinematográficos situados entre facto e ficção, realidade e alteridade, poética e biologia. O cosmismo russo é uma constelação de teorias e projetos filosóficos, artísticos e científicos informados pelo pensamento do filósofo Nikolai Fedorov, que surgiu no final do século XIX e influenciou uh, uma série de seguidores até às décadas de 1920 e 1930. Este movimento reúne discursos do marxismo, cristianismo ortodoxo russo, do iluminismo e da filosofia oriental, e propõe concepções da imortalidade tecnológica, ressurreição e viagens espaciais, especulando acerca da sua eventual materialização por meios artísticos, científicos, uh, sociais. Foi um movimento que atraiu aqueles que, após a Revolução de Outubro de 1917, se interessavam ou ambicionavam uma sociedade sem classes, o desenvolvimento das viagens espaciais e o avanço de técnicas de preservação. Na década de 1930, este movimento foi desintegrado por Stalin, aprendendo ou executando muitos dos seus membros. Os filmes de Anton Vidocq abordam a história do cosmismo e a relevância contemporânea, posicionando este movimento como precursor de movimentos mais recentes, como novos materialismos, transhumanismo, um, e para além disso, demonstram também como o cosmismo russo visava superar a finitude do espaço-tempo, também a finitude do humano, uh, através de esforços cooperativos e críticos em torno de um universalismo extraplanetário e mais do que humano, uh, propondo uh, visões críticas e talvez alguma esperança ou algum otimismo perante as condições de crise ecológica e de um certo declínio da razão. Um, este é uma série de eventos uh, que visa, uh, que, que foram elaborados em, em colaboração com Anton e que visa também uh, questionar e especular em torno da potencialidade do cosmismo para a atualidade, uh, para o discurso político e artístico contemporâneo. Uh, eu vou agora então passar para inglês e so I'm going to uh, continue in English and it is our pleasure to welcome Anton Vidov and Kathy Shukrov. Anton will uh, briefly introduce or present his films, um, show some clips of films and then talk uh, uh, about them. Kathy Shukrov will uh, present a talk entitled On Fedorov's Critic of Philosophy and Why Cosmism Decides Not to Be a Philosophy. Um, just briefly, Katy Shukrov is Associate Professor at the Higher School of Economics, Philosophy Department in Moscow, and among her books are Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism, 2020, and To Be, To Perform, Theater and Philosophic Critic of Art, 2011. Anton Vidok is an artist and filmmaker. He's the editor, founding editor of Reflux Journal, among many other projects and things. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for this introduction, and uh, thank you again, and Miguel, of course, for curating this and initiating this project, and also thank you so much to Vera for installing it so beautifully in the space and really taking care of my films, and of course, many thanks to the school for accommodating us today on such a beautiful summer day, so I'm uh, really pleased that there are so many people, because frankly, I would rather be somewhere by the river or by the sea on such a nice day. And also in the middle of COVID, you know, so it's really, for me, it's the first time in maybe, I don't know, since the beginning of this pandemic that I have been in a lecture hall with people. So it's kind of really 
quite amazing feeling that this can happen. And of course, huge thanks for, to Katie for traveling here from Moscow. This is also, I think, one of the few trips she's taken outside of the country during this pandemic. Um, and uh, it's really wonderful that she was able to come and speak with us today. Katie and I know each other for a very, very long time. I think we first met in Moscow maybe around 2010, maybe even earlier. 2006, oh my God. Uh, and uh, sh she has been kind of a very significant influence on me. Uh, I happen to think that Katie is one of the most brilliant thinkers in Russia today. So I'm really, really touched that she is here to speak about cosmism and um, yeah, to have a conversation. And uh, of course, this talk happens in the context of an exhibition. And a lot of times I find that when ex the exhibition is in one place and the talk is in a different place, a lot of people who are in this room actually haven't seen the films that are at the center of all of this. So we will show a couple of short clips, but please come and see the show. It will be up for another five or six weeks, and um, it's really worth a trip. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, I think the idea is that we'll show two very short clips. It's basically, I think, each one is about two minutes uh, of, from the films, just to sort of create a certain kind of ambiance. And then Katie will speak, we'll do a talk, and then maybe we will speak a little bit between ourselves and with you, and hopefully answer some questions. So I think we can start with the clips. and. Мы находимся в Караганде, чтобы установить аэроиона аспираторий, электрическую люстру, способную выделять отрицательно заряженные ионы. Она соответствует конструкции, которую разработал один советский ученый, который поклонялся Солнцу. Он находился в Караганде очень много лет, сначала как заключенный из правительно-трудового лагеря, начальство которого позволило ему совершать свои научные опыты по ночам в тюремной камере, затем в лагере при угольной шахте, где он открыл помещение с аэроионофикацией для продления жизни заключенных, тюремный санаторий, камера для восстановления здоровья. Ленин умер зимой. По традиции тело нужно было держать открытым в течение трех дней до оплакивания, прежде чем положить его в гроб и похоронить. Церемонию оплакивания можно увидеть на ютубе. Толпы скорбящих, снег, цветы, солдаты и лошади, река людей, сопровождающих тело. Выглядит странно, будто в трансе.
死は論理的に無意味であり倫理的に容認できず神秘的にも醜い Like also to thank、uh, Rampa and Alexandra, Miguel,、uh, Marcel, and well,、uh, this beautiful、uh, University of Art for being here and for, for this invitation. This is my first time in Portugal and in Porto, and I'm very much enjoying it and extremely glad that I'm here, but also honored that Anton invited me. Uh, and uh, I would say that the, the longer I deal with the cosmist theory, the less I understand. So you should also understand my non understanding certain things because I um, um, have、um, many doubts about it.、Um, because it has so many references references to communism, references to Christianity, references to. Uh, contemporary new materialisms, contemporary post human and trans human studies. Some even say that、um, it can be compared to certain new age uh, moods. Uh, and, and therefore, it's very difficult to place cosmism、uh, because it is very expanded and it is very contextually broad. It can be a philosophy, it is also an edifice,、uh, it has some elements of heresy within religion,、uh, but at the same time, it is also science and、um, has lots of scientific and technological、uh, backgrounds. But、uh, today, I would like to speak、um, as a philosopher and as a person who deals with philosophy, not because、uh, philosophy is something、uh, really important, but because philosophy deals with certain sort of、uh, reflection and doubting、um, uh, uh, of acknowledged issues.、Uh, therefore, I would、uh, like to dwell on Fedorov's critique of philosophy, on why he was so much against of Western philosophy. And Western history of philosophy starting with Descartes up to Marx.、Um, because, on the one hand,、uh, we talk about affinities of cosmism with commonalities and communism. On the other hand, Fyodorov himself was quite critical of socialism and of Marx, although he couldn't but acknowledge the affinities with it. So,、uh, I will start, and I hope I have half an hour.、Uh, Um, if, um, actually, if, if, if there is something that you wouldn't understand, please interrupt me because、uh, I'm not aware of what kind of audience is here, whether it's theoretic audience or artistic audience or more、um, scholarly audience.、Uh, anyway, Fedorov's writing and his cosmist predicaments demonstrate his critical rejection of Western philosophy. and As I said, it is interesting for me to trace the motives and consequences of such defiance. To start with, you probably know um, that um, Fedorov developed the ideas of immortality for all, as well as the idea of resurrection. And of course, it sounds absolutely fantastic. How can you resurrect somebody who lived 5,000 years ago or maybe 10,000 years ago? Or how can you expand your immortality? How can you expand your life to prove immortality? Well, we can expand our life, lifespan, but we cannot claim that immortality is implementable.、Uh, and of course, it's, it's important to remember that this confidence of、uh, uh, Fedorov comes, of course, from his religious background, from his Uh, Christian background, and of course,、um, the idea that instead of waiting for Christ's second coming, we should all of a sudden imagine that second coming had already happened, and therefore we should be collaborators of Christ 
in returning the human beings to paradise. Because, I mean, if we imagine that we return back to paradise and that we are not anymore those fallen, precarious, feeble creatures, uh, then our immortality becomes more imaginable uh, in this case. Uh, uh, therefore, those people who say that, oh, let's uh, get rid of this religious context of Fyodorov and let's only concentrate on technical and scientific context, I disagree with it because if we leave only uh, techno-scientific or biogenetic context, uh, then the whole idea of not simply uh, making humanity immortal, but transubstantiating the humanity, transforming this spirit or intellect or the aspirations of humanity, it remains unheeded. So um, it all comes to how to understand God. It all comes to the idea of Fyodorov and of cosmism that these socialists and Marx, they simply rely on social issues. But let's rely on life and death issues which had already been guaranteed to us by God and by God's second coming, which is also guaranteed to a certain extent. Now, this aspect um, presupposes that God had, had not been lost, that God is somewhere here that we can rely on God and we can be, as I said, collaborators of God in this business of engineering humankind in returning the humankind back to this paradisal uh, condition. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, what I want to show is that in philosophy, even when philosophy remained Christian, this was different because philosophy was not so confident in claiming that God is here and let's be comrade with God and do something together. And the same happened even with Christianity because Christianity would never put church separate from the society if it were aware that, oh, we are collaborating with God and making this business of returning to paradise. This return to paradise, both in Christianity, in confessions, in Catholicism, in reformations, in all different confessions of Christianity as well as in philosophy, was a very difficult, painful, and even tragic task. Why? Because God was remote. God was considered to be somehow around, but uh, also absent. This aspect of remoteness of God counts for Christianity too, not only for philosophy, as Christianity also evolves with the understanding of fatal fallenness of a man, of God's inaccessibility, and thereby the constant necessity for humanity to implement God's approximation by means of sermons, repentance, confession, and communion or Eucharist. That's why we need this, Christianity needs this endless uh, labor of um, ecclesi ecclesiastical experiences. Um, so while both uh, cosmism on the one hand uh, and philosophy on the other autonomize themselves from classical church, from classical religious sermon, they do so in different ways. For philosophy, detachment from religion and church results in the acknowledgement of the inevitable loss of God, inevitable disability of mind, as this mind does not have God anymore to rely on him. And this is how philosophy starts, uh, that human being, this new Vitruvian man, Renaissance man, cannot rely on God. We are not anymore the sons and daughters of God, but simply human beings. This is the condition that Fyodorov hates, for instance. Philosopher, therefore, accepts remaining without God in ontological alienation when the kinship is decomposed, kinship of church parish, for instance. Um, and uh, a little bit further on, I will show how Derrida demonstrates this excellently in his analysis of Descartes. And don't be afraid, it will not be boring. It's, it's really very adventurous. Um, so for cosmism, conversely, co cosmism also detaches itself from classical church. But for cosmism, this detachment from classical church, on the contrary, confirms. Why do I need church? Is, 
if God is already with us, if God is already the co-engineer with us of this eternal humanity and building the eternal time of regulating immortality. Um, therefore, uh, God's remoteness is not an ontological problem uh, for uh, cosmism anymore. Hence, Fyodorov's accusation of philosophy in deliberate reluctance to resolve the issues which in philosophy are often claimed unthinkable, doubtable, ineffable, and thus remain not in the realm of acting or implementing some empirical tasks, because for uh, Fyodorov, immortality is an empirical task, right? It's a technical and biological task. But philosophy gets stuck in, in the realm of speculation, doubting. Uh, and my assignment today would be to show how even Marx and communism, as Marx is the continu continuation of dialectical tradition and Hegel's dialectics, and even Christianity, because Christianity also has this dialectics and uh, constant indecision, remain in the domain of philosophy, while Fyodorov and Cosmism choose and prefer not to. So interestingly, uh, the rebuke to philosophy that we hear from Fyodorov uh, can be heard also in uh, 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 artificial intelligence theories or new materialist theories or cognitive and brain studies uh, as they also claim that uh, history of philosophy shows that philosophy was always claiming some irresolvable, unthinkable issues instead of resolving them. And if thinking is not simply abstract reason but brain, then we can very easily resolve them through uh, neural networks or some discrete um, uh, digital um, means. And uh, this thought we can come across in, in the works by Nigaristani, uh, Ray Kurzweil, Thomas Metzinger. And now shifting uh, to Derrida. Uh, while uh, the above-mentioned scientists um, think that thought is something that might have a guaranteed outcome, like a sentence, action, so thought should be pragmatic, and thereby philosophy is simply some sort of artificial sophistics, artificial senseless speculation. Derrida, in his Cogito and Insanity, demonstrates that such feeble precarity of philosophy is grounded in insanity. So it's not simply that philosophy tries to be too compl complex, too sophisticated, but this inability to make a certain kind of practical uh, decisions uh, is very deep, and it's very deeply rooted in insanity, and this convergence of philosophy and of even Cartesian rationality with insanity was discovery of Derrida. Because if someone of you is from philosophy, you would know that usually Descartes is connected with rationality. And Foucault, Michel Foucault, in his works, he claimed that, okay, uh, um, uh, Descartes was someone who could not understand what is to be mad what is to be insane, because cogito, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, claims that um, rationality excludes insanity. But Derrida makes this revolutionary discovery that no, the beginning of philosophy, which we think is rational, is completely inscribing into itself insanity. So uh, Derrida discovers thinking as the very verge of insanity. And to start with, what is the motivation of this insanity? Of course, that God is no more a guarantee of our being. As we remember, in his discourse on method, Descartes defines thinking as doubt, because cogito thinking is at the same time doubting. And first, how this horror of madness starts with Descartes is that first he doubts existence of senses. For instance, I look at my hands and I doubt that these hands exist, right? So how can I know that they are real? 
then he doubts even more simple senses, and then he tries to overcome his doubts by relying on God, saying that, oh, maybe God knows that I exist, and if I rely on God, then my being and my presence and my existence can be confirmed. But then the terrible failure takes place because even God is suspected in being an evil demon who deceives. And at this moment when Descartes says that even God is the, might be an evil demon who deceives, uh, the whole building uh, decomposes and uh, the co cogito emerges as a support uh, to confront this madness, to confront the fear of madness and the fear of dying. And as Derrida puts it, cogito does not annul madness because the clinical mad is not as mad as the one who adjusts to his fear of madness, this rational cogito, to confront this fear of madness. So usually we think that uh, what Descartes made, he separated, as we remember, sensuousness. So everything that we, we feel is not reliable. But there are some abstract mathematical truths. For instance, even if I die, if, even if I am ill, even if I am, my life is ebbing, two plus two will always be four. Or even uh, uh, if, God forbid, somebody is in the hospital, um, the geometric figures will remain geometric figures, like tri triangle, square, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, the problem is that precisely this separation implies not so much certainty of this verifiable knowledge, but the, it implies the fear of madness and the fear of death that compels the subject to search for certainty in the absence of any certitudes. So uh, uh, if there is no God then, as Derrida puts it, this proximity to derangement to madness is no longer a disorder of the body, uh, but is a madness that will bring subversion into the very pure thought itself, even into mathematical truths. And now I will show how Derrida speculates to prove this. So usually when we think about cogito ergo sum, um, our uh, interpretation is that I think, therefore, I am, where thinking confirms that being happens automatically, uh, but Derrida argues that we should interpret it otherwise, and he shows that there is no certitude in this statement. And the backstage of this uh, speculation is as follows. Even if the totality of the world does not exist, even if non-meaning has invaded the totality of the world, including the very contents of my thought, so even if my thought is madness, even if I might be dying at the moment, I still think, therefore I am while I think. Even if I do not, in fact, grasp this totality of thinking, if I neither understand nor embrace it, I still formulate the very project of doing so, of thinking so. And I'm trying to be rational, but in this attempt to be rational despite my incapacities and feebleness is mad, as even more mad than the clinical madness. This is the um, conclusion of Derrida. Now, if we think that this only happens with Descartes, or if this, this is only the observation of uh, uh, Derrida, we would be mistaken be because let's skip several centuries back to Socrates and let's look at the dialogue Fido, when Socrates has already taken the hemlock and you know that he took the hemlock voluntarily um, uh, and uh, in this dialogue he is dying already, he's losing his mind He's losing his bodily living forces, and he's surrounded by disciples who observe his dying, and they are deploring his dying, and they are deploring um, that they are losing their teacher. But 
um, Socrates is telling them that they shouldn't be sad uh, because despite the incapacity to confirm his sanity, despite, despite the incapacity for Socrates to confirm his living forces, he too claims that he still thinks, he tries to persuade his disciples who watch his gradual dying that he is able to think despite the acceptance of dying while persevering uh, in still thinking and while preserving the capacity to think in these unbearable conditions. And he tells them that dying correctly is the task of philosophy. So it's not that dying is good, but that thinking capacity is confirmed in this temporality of dying. I am not dead until I'm thinking. And this existence is intensified precisely with dying. And by the way, Deleuze made uh, the, the similar uh, discussions of why uh, this intensity of death confirms living and thinking, but I will not uh, um, uh, talk about this. But uh, uh, another thing is also uh, to confirm that Socrates is the figure that determines the end of God, the end of mythology, the end of reliance o on gods, which means that the subtraction of God from being generates philosophic doubt by definition and dialectics, dialectics which emerges as the method of existing being and discourse with uh, Socratic philosophy, is one of the forms of philosophic doubt in ancient uh, Greece after bidding farewell to reliance on gods and deities, which used to be characteristic for uh, mythology. Now, much later, Bifo Berardi will say that thinking is, in fact, not merely intelligence, but also sensuous consciousness inscribed in time and becoming. And the intensity and capacity of thinking is due to death as the ultimate destination of time. So if we didn't have this ultimate destination of time, the reason would function differently. And this reason, this speculation, this dialectical capacity and production of ideas is due to uh, death and due to mortality. But then acceptance of this mortality confirms immortality in some kind of oblique way when we have uh, thinking, history, diachronics, and culture. So it is death that forms thinking and thinking is thus interpreted by Bifo Berardi as the experience of sensuous consciousness. Uh, and he interprets the word experience as experire, which implies death, dying. And indeed, following Berardi's argument, uh, I would add that even if we imagine that, for instance, Fedorov achieved this idea that everyone becomes immortal and we live in this immortality, still it would be impossible to um, exclude the pace of time because, you know, the problem is not simply that we are immortal and we never die, but that certain experiences end. Uh, and death is not simply the death of body, but the, the death of certain experience. For instance, when love ends, or when affection ends, or when trust ends, or when some, some things become irreversible. And even if we are immortal, there will be those irreversible things which we want to return, but which cannot be returned. And this is ending, this is experire, as Berardi very well um, uh, interprets. Even if there is immortality, something ends and remains um, uh, irreversible. In his article, which uh, Berardi dedicated to Anton Vidocla's immortality filmography, uh, Bifo Berardi adds, 
Immortality research is perfectly opposite and complementary to my obsession, becoming nothing. For me, the triumph of consciousness is the obliteration of the world. We call it death, but we might see it as an act of cosmic potency of the self. My focus is consciousness. Anton Vidocle's focus is energy. I say that death is the triumph of consciousness. Anton says that matter is eternal and life is limited only because an error occurred and this error is death. We are both right and wrong. And probably if you watch Anton's films, you will be aware to what extent he goes very deep into this uh, dialectics of um, uh, appearing and disappearing, existence and non-existence. Uh, and uh, I would also emphasize uh, Boris Groys's statement in Museum as the Cradle of Revolution, who also claims the same. The role of death defines an incentive launching the philosophic reasoning. Now I shift to uh, Fyodorov uh, to say, uh, so the, the conclusion to our um, uh, arguments was that only the presence and protection which we get from God could guarantee um, the ontological uh, togetherness, the, uh, uh, the, uh, our capacity to surpass this ontological groundlessness of doubt. But mere knowledge about God does not suffice here. What is necessary also that um, God is considered to be present uh, God is considered to be somebody who is directly communicated, as may be in certain kind of magic or in certain kind of primitive uh, cultures where, where deities or in pagan cults where deities were in such proximity that they could be in exchange with us, in communication with us. Uh, as we have already described in Christianity and in philosophy, this proximity of deities is impossible. But for Fyodorov, why he bids farewell to church, um, he was, wants to install this proximity, to guarantee this proximity of deity, of God, to start his business of uh, engineering the immortality. And uh, he only accepts this type of... Um, uh, uh, commons and or, or, or organizing the humanity uh, when uh, we have to fulfill time into eternity and um, guarantee Christ's second coming uh, as if the second coming is already taking place. Now in uh, Fyodorov's edifice about regulation of life and death um, as I said, the main thing is the confidence that divine power has already been provided. Uh, while in Christianity, although God is considered existent, he's not present for direct communication, as I said. That's why in Christianity you need this labor of anagogia. Anagogia means ascendance. And uh, uh, it, it is not simply something positive and affirmative, but uh, if anyone had if any one of you had the experience of confession or repentance, it's a very negative um, experience and permeated uh, by the fact that um, whether your sins are atoned, whether you are not more a sinner, is not tangible. Uh, it's, it remains intangible and ungraspable. Fyodorov, meanwhile, announces that entirety of humanity is capable of divinity in advance, and there is no need for the expectation of God's grace. Um, in other words, in Fyodorov's cosmism, to accomplish total regulation, one needs to already claim that we are saint, we are divine, and our sins uh, could be atoned, and um, we could be embodied in, in our divine realization. Um, so again, uh, 
Cartesian doubt or philosophic question or Christian question would be, uh, how can we guarantee this, that our sins are atoned? Because, you know, uh, if you go deeper into patristics, what is sin? Sin is not something like you uh, hit the little child and then you go to the priest and you tell that, oh, forgive me, uh, I, I, hit, I, I did something bad. But sin is something very deep. Uh, something that you are aware of, but you cannot correct it. For instance, uh, you have greediness, but you cannot stop being greedy, or you cannot uh, stop being treacherous, because it's your nature. This is why God gives human being freedom, not simply regulate you to get rid of sins, but to be free in choosing whether to get rid of sins or not get rid of sins. And this is why also church is separate from sociality and separate from society. And when theocratic societies come and say, we want sociality and church to be together, uh, it is violation, first of all, of this idea of freedom. Because I don't know whether I want to be with God. I don't know whether I want my sins to be atoned, and I don't know whether these sins will be atoned or not. It's only the business of God's mercy, but God is absent. Um, um, now, um, thus, uh, to confirm it, to what extent Fedorov's confidence is strong and to what extent he comes to this Christianity as heresy, in, in a certain sense, and comes uh, to some kind of post-ecclesiastical theocracy, uh, which will be regulated technically and biogenetically. Um, and the last point may be, uh, now what is common for philosophy uh, and Christianity as against polytheist religions or pagan cults, uh, is, uh, again, that pagan cults, uh, um, they are transcendent, but they are corporeal. They have bodies. And you can see that in Japanese, uh, in Japanese Shintoism, for instance, you know, the spirits are constantly present, communicating, etc. They are approachable, appliable uh, through daily means. Um, Whereas Christian church, um, um, as I said, has to be separate because this total um, implementation of brotherhood or sisterhood uh, is, not, um, is not implementable. Uh, and to emphasize in Christianity and theology, the transcendent remains incorporeal. Um, as humanity is not yet sufficiently divine, uh, and redemption therefore requires incessant sermon of confession and of metanoia. Metanoia is this transposition of consciousness. Uh, which happens during repentance, the event of this transposition, without which you cannot get rid of sins or, or you cannot revelate, you cannot get to new condition of your consciousness, new, new stage of your consciousness. While cosmism initially posits a theurgical goal um, and uh, claims that this synergy simulation of humans uh, with Christ um, can be... Uh, regulated through biotechnical optimization. And uh, two more important issues that I want to stress. I mean, you remember the uh, resurrection of Lazarus. And in Russian, there are two words for resurrection, воскрешение and воскресение. So when Christ helps Lazarus to rise, this is воскрешение, which means that Lazarus comes to his living body, but it is not what should happen after second coming of Christ. So Lazarus is bringing to life is not resurrection yet. He is simply brought into living from his dead body to living body. 
whereas resurrection that should take place after Christ's second coming is the spiritual transposition of humankind and their acquisition and achievement of nuova vita, new life. This is the paradisal life, of course, the life which is about coming back to paradise, but without this huge uh, inhuman event of second coming, um, uh, uh, this is not even thinkable. Thus, we have these two ethical or uh, semantic uh, words in Russian, воскрешение and воскресение, who remain spiritually and even semantically uh, different. Uh, in other words, the change of life into Nuova Vita through biotechnical acceleration would not be possible. It needs not only bodily uh, uh, um, restoration, but spiritual transubstantiation in the aftermath of uh, Second Coming. Uh, second Coming and only it would refurbish uh, Christianity into new edifice. And actually, Mm, uh, uh, if uh, Fyodorov lived, for instance, in 18th century, maybe this heresy of his would be reformation, something that in Russian church did not happen. This would be uh, what in uh, uh, Western uh, Christianity was Luther's reformation or Calvin's reformation, etc. Uh, and another question is, of course, kinship. This is really crucial because kinship for Fyodorov and kinship in Christianity on, and communism, for me, are different. Why? Um, as you know, uh, it is true that in Christianity we have this notion of God's daughters and God's sons. And we also have this notion of brotherhood and sisterhood. And uh, Fyodorov's critique of communism was that, well, these people are only based on social, economic, exchange and how can something that is only confined to social economic equality be truly sisterhood or truly brotherhood uh, or truly just implement what is uh, commons uh, for church and for Christianity. Therefore he uh, really endowed the word kinship, uh, ratstvo, uh, with a very, uh, very big and very important meaning. Uh, yet, I would say that, I would dare say that for Christianity, as I think, um, what is important is not kinship, which is much more a patriarchal or paternalist notion, but for Christianity, it already is important to bid farewell to these primitive societies. Because for Christianity, there is no Judean and no... Hellenistic, right? Uh, it's some kind of new universalism which can unite people despite their um, relative bonds, despite, despite their blood uh, relations. Uh, and uh, uh, in Christianity, as well as, by the way, in Marx um, and uh, communism, it is important that generic affiliation and solidarity between anyone is be between strangers. It is important that we love each other despite we are strangers. For instance, uh, when Christianity says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's not love your relative who is your father, mother, uncle, etc. But it is anyone, it is stranger. And love this stranger or love your enemy uh, despite that it is not a relative. Uh, the same is in communism where we have comradeship. So let's have this political eros despite the fact that we are strangers. And by, by the way, Badiou in his uh, uh, book about St. Paul brings this uh, question of universality. Whereas for Fyodorov, uh, even people who are nowadays strangers 
well, for him it is important that, for instance, between you and me, there will be some kind of biotechnogenetic analysis that we shall have some overlappings of relativity and we shall find out some genetic analysis that would, that would prove that we are somehow molecularly or somehow biologically, biogenetically uh, re related. So for him, this generational relatedness, blood relatedness, biogenetic relatedness uh, is very important. Um, and as I say, it is very much different from what we have in communism and in Christianity. Um, so precisely because of this mixture of positivist scientism and certain kind of occult determinism, Fedorov's cosmism resonates so well with contemporary materialisms and with contemporary techno-animisms. As you know, contemporary techno-animisms and post-human studies also talk about this uh, hybridization of humankind and um, I have come across in new materialisms and the uh, speculations about ancestrality uh, in speculative realism, this idea that uh, the unit of existence is not human mind or human being, but the unit of existence are clusters of certain kind of assemblage of molecules, of atoms, uh, hybridities of certain uh, material assemblages. Um, um, and... Uh, Perhaps um, I would end uh, it um, with this statement that uh, if the cosmist sociality consists of certain sort of resurrected mini-gods, the communist sociality consists of um, precarious philosophers who are aware of their inevitable feebleness and mortality. And then their immortality develops symbolically in communist and philosophic context as the acceptance of death through the techniques of preserving reasoning despite various forms of precarities, insanities. So, for instance, political economy of communism when you exclude private property and deprivatization becomes the core of forming culture and thought in such communist sociality. Um, and of course, to repeat that a communist uh, political economy as well as um, socialism, historical socialism, hinges very much on materialist dialectics. And what is dialectics? Again, dialectics is this technique when nothing is the self. Whereas for Fyodorov, you should have discrete selves. In new materialisms as well, you should have discrete selves because you should have the data to, at certain point, have optimized data to be accumulated. Whereas for dialectics, everything has the other self. And for Hegel, this was the principal notion, uh, under, under sein that everything is its own other self. Uh, and this is how labor is organized, because this is not simply the pen, but labor of millions of people, diachronicity, historicity, etc. And this historicity is dialectical and is incommensurable. It cannot be discrete and database-based. I would end here, and uh, if there are any questions and uh, any comments or critique, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katie. Very interesting and a lot to process, <laughs> I would say. Anton, would you like to comment on the, say something else about your films or shall we um, open, we can gather all together here and already open to the, to the public I think and engage in dialogue? You know, it will probably take me uh, a couple of months to think about what Katie <laughs> just said. <laughs> because it was so rich with uh, uh, all sorts of uh, really kind of uh, interesting ideas that I cannot process it fast enough.
but tell more about mm. Cosmist Edifice. Um, no, it's quite interesting, uh, you know, because it is such an unusual talk, because one of the things that we don't talk about so much in the context of gatherings around contemporary art events, right, is religion. Religion has been kind of somewhat exiled from the discourse on art since, I don't know, since art separated itself from, you know, the sort mm -hmm. of church as being the main sort of commissioner, curator, instigator of art projects. And it's really quite interesting for me also because I'm not a Christian. You know, I, I happen to be very interested in cosmism, but my family is primarily Jewish, uh, but also maybe not only, there are some Russians in it, but uh, from the period where people were not, could not and did not want to be religious, from the Soviet era, yeah, where um, that did not play uh, such a big part in yeah, um, society. So it's always like when I deal with Fyodorov and Cosmism, you know, part of it, it's, it's like something very, very interesting for me, but not being Christian, not believing in God, not being a religious person, uh, it, it stays a, a kind of a, let's say, almost exotic abstraction, yeah? Mm -hmm. At the same time, the other side of it, I mean, the way maybe I understand religion a little bit being a non-religious person. It's one way to, to, to deal, to address the fear of death, you know, because the condition that Katie was describing, which actually I had no idea that Derrida wrote on this, and this is shocking and incredibly interesting, yeah? I must read this. Uh, but the, this idea that, okay, we're all sitting here in this room and we're all dying, basically. We're all dying incrementally. The worst part of it is we don't know when we're going to die. It could happen right now. I could just drop dead. It could happen when I'm on the street or tonight in the hotel or tomorrow on the plane at any moment. So the, the, the insanity of our condition of existence being subject to death and never knowing when it's going to occur for most people, yeah? Some people know exactly when it's going to occur, yeah? Like terminally ill, you know? It's just something so maddening, like how can human psychology reconcile itself to living permanently in, in this condition? Animals are blessed, they're lucky, they don't know, they don't understand their own mortality. Boris Groys talks about, talks about cosmism sometimes as like the, the refusal to be like, like cattle, uh, refusing to, to be slaughtered. By, by death, by mortality, yeah? Um, so all of these are like really, really interesting and you know, very important personally, psychologically ideas that in some way, but I, I address, but I address them through films maybe not so much in terms of speaking or writing uh, usually. Um, there was a whole bunch of other things that I wanted to say, but yeah, maybe, but maybe, there, yeah, maybe there are questions, yeah, sure. So does anyone want to comment or have a question? Okay, there's one question over there. Uh, I want to ask uh, about the concept of sin, because uh, you mentioned anagoria. And so in my understanding, uh, sin is an error, correct, for Christianity. Because it has to do with the fallen nature. And it's true that the ideal of issue of the fallen nature is the upset. Yes, it's a very good question uh, because, uh, well, it's a very big tradition in Christianity. Uh, it's a very big tradition in Christianity to uh, start living up to death. Like uh, in Christian tradition, lots of people would say that dying is meeting uh, the deity and therefore it's the time when the sins can be atoned. Uh, 
so uh, for Fyodor, this is unacceptable, and this is something that he doesn't accept in Christianity, that uh, Christianity uh, somehow complies with this uh, um, transcendent immor immortality, immortality that comes after death, uh, and immortality that is uh, somehow um, living with the confidence that you are anyway immortal if you uh, go through repentance, through ecclesiastical procedures, etc. But I also agree that sin does not exist, that sin is certain kind of error. On the other hand, since we are dead here, and since we are fallen here, we cannot, we cannot be sovereign, as Fyodorov thinks, in atoning our sins. That's why we need church. And the church uh, is not atoning our sins by means of priests who are humans, but it atones it through some kind of um, uh, mystical mysteries, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, sermon. Uh, therefore, um, uh, I, would I would say that this was the reason that uh, Fyodorov wanted to come out of this economy and come out of this institutional construction to somehow establish completely different uh, institutional project uh, which would um, um, get rid of this fear of the remoteness of God. I think that this was very difficult, but he was probably a very... Uh, courageous person. On the other hand, I, uh, uh, Anton, I, ca I am aware of this fact that in art context it's very difficult to talk about God, but you know, you cannot ignore this in uh, Fyodorov, because if you deeply read him, it is constantly there. Um. Uh, yes, he mentions God in every sentence, which is kind of interesting. It's so obsessive, it's like almost like an overkill, you know. But as you read his writing, you know, I, t at a certain point I kind of realized, well, his conception of God is truly, I mean, okay, Christian God for me is already incomprehensible, this whole Trinity thing, you know, three, being, three separate persons as, as one God, as the Holy Family, this is completely crazy, yeah? Uh, but his concept is even more expanded because I think maybe one place where I slightly disagree with Katie is that what he means by resurrection, I think, from reading him, is not uh, that in that process of being resurrected, as in Christianity, you basically you're atoned, you're freed from the sin, and then you're kind of a godlike entity in paradise. Mm -hmm. No, you're being resurrected to put, to put you to work, and to put you to work, first of all, to resurrect others. Yeah, so his imaginary mm -hmm. of this community of immortal humans, you know, is a Our community, who, who, it's constant labor, mm -hmm. it's labor out of love, because you love your others so much that you want to dedicate every second of your life to, to the project of bringing them back to life, to resurrecting them from death. Uh, but that's not even the end for him, because I think this is the first horizon. The second one is even more uh, you know, gigantic, which is basically he feels that, uh, he felt that as a conscious being, we have a certain duty or responsibility to the unconscious matter that makes up most of our universe, the, the universe, what? unconscious matter, you okay. know, like the stable, in inorganic stuff, yeah, uh, not animals, not plants, because let's say animals absolutely feel and think and are conscious and we can discuss possibilities of consciousness and plant life, which is, I think, they are to some extent conscious. But let's say things like stones and planets and atoms and all of that. So he felt that it is kind of our obligation to basically embark on this enormous universal educational project to teach inorganic matter, to teach dead matter how to be conscious, how to feel how to think, yeah? So that at the end of this gigantic project, which will take an infinity, yeah? Because the universe is infinite. And it's also very difficult to teach this glass how to perceive me, for example. That the entire universe will be conscious, united, and would form a kind of a single organism in the same way that the Christian Trinity, you could have three people that are one God, 
So this kind of multiplicity that is completely united. And in that moment, it will be identical to God. Yeah? It will not replace God, but it will be, uh, for all practical matters, exactly identical to God. Yeah? But it will be completely made through the labor of immortal humans. And once they teach some forms of inorganic life, maybe, I don't know, other planets can help somehow. Yeah, but, but this, and he called this an art project. This is really incredible that for him, this is a true artwork. So there are two artworks that he talks about very specifically. One is that for him, a real artwork is an, art, is an act of resurrection. Like if you can bring something or somebody back to life, that is a work of art. And the second, even bigger work of art is this project of uh, emancipation of the universe, yeah? But it's collective, it's not an individual practice, it's a completely collective pro project on a universal scale. Um, yeah. Uh, I just would like to um, add, or picking up on that, what, it, what you mentioned, is there any relation between cosmism or, um, and Spinoza? Did Spinoza in any way influence mm, uh, Fedorov? Because Spinoza also had this idea that there was only one common substance, which was God, and then it manifested in the universe in, in different attributes and substance and modes. modes. Yes, I, okay. I totally agree that if, if we were to, uh, I, I totally agree that if we were to compare it with any philosophical context, this would be much more Spinozist than Hegelian, mm -hmm. uh, because Spinozism uh, definitely has uh, this immanence of the uh, conceptual and the material. Uh, um, uh, but um, I, uh, if I were to um, uh, uh, somehow comment on what Anton said, this is a really a very important thing, a no sphere, so producing the universe as a thinking universe. And by the way, this is also a Spinozist idea that um, uh, thinking is attribute of matter, mm. right? So. When you have meta somewhere, meta will be developing gradually into thinking. But humankind are part of this mm -hmm. nature, which are the conceptual attribute of <coughs> meta. So this was very fashionable also in communist context to, th to think in this Spinozist um, context. But what is still not quite clear um, is that, I mean, um, Let's imagine that he does not need God for this, right? That there is some kind of evolutionary process that we can teach inorganic matter how to think, that we can go into this labor of resurrection, expansion, uh, and uh, scientific uh, investigations. Um, uh, but um, uh, 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 Still, um, you, you know, he is ignoring uh, two things. He's ignoring um, the real um, remoteness of second coming, uh, one thing. And another thing is that he totally ignores the politeconomic uh, uh, questions, mm -hmm. which are necessary to organize technicity. So he thinks that all the technical issues can be resolved without uh, polit economic and uh, social interference. But, but, but he does write about economics. Uh, he, uh, there is very clear indication that a private property would be abolished in the society, in the Fedorovian society. Consumption of luxuries would be abolished. It will clearly be central planned economy, which is socialist yes, economy. Yes, exactly, but he doesn't yeah. say how to do it. I mean, Marx develops a certain kind of dialectical uh, edifice, how to do it. it. It should be either revolution, it should be certain theory of value. So he doesn't produce the theory of certain kind of dealing with these political economic questions. He does, doesn't give the tools, he gives the belief. Uh, this is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he, he gives the necessity, okay, it would be good if it's brotherhood which is equal, which has no luxury, which is not dedicating itself to consumption, but it is not possible. I mean, on the one hand, he's insisting on this practicality, uh, but 
paradoxically, it is philosophic tradition that brought to revolution mm -hmm. and brought mm -hmm. to this <laughs> abolishment of private property. But could you maybe, could we come back to this notion of labor relevant for cosmism? Because if labor is so relevant for cosmism, but he does not really explain how can this common task be yeah. reached? I, I could never, exp uh, I could never, I could never understand how he would compel people to labor. Because I mean, to in socialism, labor is common good. So you have to make people somehow be aware. So to understand that labor is necessary, you should become philosopher. So it should be a Socrates to understand the common good, the, co the labor's common good. In, um, uh, um, in uh, Fyodorov, we have the hierarchical society. For, for, for instance, he thinks that we should give education to peasants, but um, he's not believing into absolute equality somehow. Mm -hmm. That, I'm sorry. No? Uh, well, he's a monarchist. He really supports. Yeah, he's a monarchist. Yeah. He supports. But, but, yeah. but uh, I think he understood the figure of the Tsar as largely kind of a symbolic center that's devoid of power uh, around which things are organized. And I think that the, the, in terms of labor or the motivation for all of this labor, right? He, he writes a lot about love and I realize how maybe corny it sounds and very like hippie-like, but I think what he means is like what wouldn't you do to save somebody you love from death? You know, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your child, your parent, you know, like sometimes this could be such a potent force that is, there is a kind of energetics in it, yeah? It's not only a feeling, but uh, it can produce incredible action, yeah? So basically he was kind of, he modeled his, the model of society. Again, like for me, this is a little bit difficult to understand because I'm not religious and because I'm not a Christian, yeah? But for him, the, the, the sort of, the mechanism of all of this was already existent in the Holy Family, yeah? It's this relationship between the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit uh, that needed to be replicated in every single relationship throughout the entirety of human population, yeah? Like, we, that we should all relate to each other the way members of the Trinity relate to each other, yeah? But again, like, it's so funny for me to speak about this because I really... Uh, yes, uh, I remember his writing in, um, uh, when he talks about political organization and he uh, be truly believes that Tsar, that the king, can somehow be embodiment of the Holy Spirit. And it is important for him that if you love the king and if you are subservient, if you are vassal to king, then you, you only have love. But this is utopia of the monarchist society that mm, everyone is loving the, uh, the, subjects. the mm. subjects. Everyone are subjected to the king. And if, if this love is absolute and this is monarchic absolutism, then through this absolutism you can guarantee that you only work through love and love is the working force. But I mean, for instance, Marx shows us that we have contradictions. Without contradictions, apart from love, there is hatred, and there is competition, and there is exploitation, uh, and there is murder, uh, and there is humiliation. Uh, so there is deprivation. So there are those people who are deprived. So. Uh, without restoring this deprivation or without dealing with deprivation through certain kind of uh, concrete tools, how can you simply establish this um, very beautiful condition of trinity or uh, love? For instance, Freud shows us that um, one moment you love your father, another moment you hate your father. It's not permanent, right? So it's very, it's very difficult. I mean, today I, I love my parents and tomorrow I'm angry with them. Absolutely. So. But the thing is that I think he just didn't see any other alternative, you know, because the alternative is death. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, something like that. You have another question. Yeah. 
Please. Yeah, uh, I think the issue is that the only possibility for this true war would be the transformation. Because that's the idea of uh, Christianity. Yeah? It's simply. So this is why I, also the issue that you spoke about the Holy Trinity. I think Holy Trinity is quite interesting because it breaks dialectics. Yes. So it kind of you know, transforms this issue of the dialogue, which is why Greek philosophy I don't know, kind of fell for this uh, revelation of Christ. But do you, a very good and, uh, point. The philosophy in terms of what you spoke with Socrates and his example, well, it was, his example is a bit proto martyr but I think the dialogue of philosophy for the Greeks end up not being sufficient. So apparently the revelation of Christ mm -hmm. transformed is why it, the, all the Greek concepts were trans, trans, transformed trans, 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 to Christianity. Yes. Uh, but my doubt about the issue of love would be, I think it's only possible with synergy. And this synergy would be with them created energies of God. They are uh, twin mm -hmm. energies. They are, and this is also, again, to finish my question, another doubt that arose is that you spoke that God is not present in terms of like for our God here, Davis, mm -hmm. is present, which is much nearer to the surface mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. us. But apparently, through the prayer and the issue of the illumination, the path that you centered, <laughs> good. I mean, very, very good points, and very, uh, thank you very much for this. I think that synergy is precisely the tool that he develops to talk about love. So somehow he believes in energy, in somehow plugging into this synergetic uh, energy, and uh, so that the material natural forces are collaborators of, of humankind, but he excludes these negative alienating things that are constantly being the stumbling blocks uh, in, in human labor. So labor is not smooth. Uh, it, it, even in, in very simple, small, small, I don't know, artel or firm, you, you cannot organize labor without certain kind of gaps. Yeah. But one more thing, Anton, sorry. I wouldn't agree with you that uh, Trinity is, is not dialectical, but maybe I'm mistaken and maybe I should know more. Yeah, sorry. I mean, Trinity, uh, Trinity uh, well, I heard from certain theologians that Trinity is a paradoxic number. It's two and something. Mm -hmm. So it's never three like mathematical three, but it's každý čiřiš sebe dva. Everyone through himself is two, but at the same time three. So two equals three. And it's one plus one and something. So it's a very paradoxic thing, and just because it is not even numbers, it, it is dialectical, but like meta-dialectical. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Anton. I, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, we, had another, <laughs> we had another question there. Mm -hmm. and science because 
Uh, sure, it is straightforward, yeah, but I don't think that, uh, you know, it's so direct because it's, what interests me more in Fyodorov's approach to art is the, the radical equality he sees between artistic work and science and political organization and uh, any kind of other field, medicine, you know, whatever, that all of, all of it for him is absolutely equal in the project of, uh, of developing immortality and resurrecting everybody who ever lived. And it's, f f as an artist, it's really inspiring for me just because I always feel quite alienated at like political gatherings. Like once I was at a, a very big gathering in Berlin organized by Slavoj Žižek, which was supposed to, like a three-day conference that was supposed to really confront the question of uh, uh, art and the revolution, you know? And I came there and they talked for three days and almost everybody that Katie mentioned, except for some people were there, Alain Badiou was there. <laughs> and basically, after a couple of days, I kind of realized that what, the way they see it is that artists should like design T-shirts. <laughs> you know, this, this was the place left for arts within their kind of new conception of new communism and new revolutionary process. So Fedorov is the opposite. He gives the artist so much power. In fact, he calls the entire project an artwork, an art project, yeah? It's like a complete reversal. So I don't know if it directly answers your question, but I think through artistic practice, you, yes, you could rearrange life you, because you're actually doing that or you're, you're rearranging matter and that's, you know that, uh, and because when the distinctions between what is life matter, what is dead matter, if you consider that resurrection could be possible, and you know, then what is dead is not necessarily dead. Yeah, for example, he doesn't really even acknowledge that there is something called death. He just looks at death as as a disease. Yeah, so all of the people who lived and died, they're basically sick. They're still here, but they're ill. So it's really necessary to be almost like a doctor, like a surgeon, you need to treat them, yeah? Uh, I know it sounds like completely phantasmagorical, but I, this is maybe what excites me so much about his writing is that it, it's like an incredible image, yeah? And may I answer your uh, statement? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for this. Um, th th thank you for this comment that uh, he rather influenced Western philosophy than somehow uh, can be the critical of it. I mean, first of all, I um, initiated this uh, debate because he himself writes uh, 300 pages and dedicates 300 pages to his hatred to Western philosophy, but. Uh, actually, I would agree with you if we were to talk about Western civilization. So if we speak in civilizational terms uh, to what philosophy comes to in contemporary new materialisms when it beats farewell itself to philosophy. So the, the end of Western philosophy is in bidding farewell to what was philosophical in it. And in this sense, Fedorov is very contemporary and he somehow even uh, 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 jubilates uh, what Western philosophy ended up with in terms of this civilizational outcome. But if we remain in philosophic traditions and if we like look back into Hegel's phenomenology or if we look back into Marx's uh, capital and political economy, then we would understand that what philosophy is as a texture, uh, as, a, as a method, as an ethics, uh, would be different and we understand why he was so much against it. Uh, because he lives in 19th century when philosophy is the embodiment of its own philosophicality. Miguel?
I don't have an interesting answer. I, it was early in the morning, I knew I needed to find some clips, so I cho chose this one, yeah. Could have been any other clip, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, so maybe Katie wants to say something. Uh, well, uh, um, actually, uh, I was thinking about this Lazarus issue uh, because it's a, it's a it's a very important thing uh, in in theology. Uh, this is the moment uh, how Christ enters Jerusalem, and he starts with the res resurrecting Lazarus, uh, because it's it's his very close and uh, friendly family, uh, and. Uh, um, everyone thinks that now he will be resurrecting everyone, and they are very happy about it. And uh, uh, the, the whole Jerusalem becomes supportive of Christ, uh, but then they see that he does not resurrect anyone. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that it is precisely for unlawful, illegal resurrection that he gets condemned, but then people who either have to choose his death either have to choose his crucifixion or not, because uh, Pilatus allowed him to be pamilovan. Uh, 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 for, uh, uh, forbidden? For, for forbidden. For, forgiven. 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 Allowed him to be forgiven. Um, they, precisely those people who supported him, believing that he will be re resurrecting everyone, they choose his crucifixion because he did not go on with resurrection. So there is this tendency in uh, theology that uh, th this was very important, uh, that precisely because he didn't go on further with resurrection, they chose him to die because he's a false messiah. He cannot even resurrect properly. He only resurrected one, one person. But uh, Christ precisely Christ doesn't go on with it because it is not that resurrection. It is not воскресенье. It is воскрешение. It is not yet time. So this moment that it is not yet time for that resurrection until his crucifixion happens. This is a very mystical thing and it, it, it splits somehow the humanity who awaits for this quick a resurrective factory and that resurrection that might uh, be well expected as um, as some as some kind of nuova vita that if, well that the whole European tradition actually and culture writes about in medi medieval and Renaissance period. You know the uh, new film that I'm working on right now is based on the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is. Um, maybe about 6,000 years old. It's much older than Christianity, Judaism, most religions that exist today. It, it, and basically, the epic is the, 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 so basically a quest for immortality. Yeah? And it's a kind of, in some ways, it's a very simple story where basically Gilgamesh's best friend Enkidu dies. And when Gilgamesh is confronted with the reality of the death of the best friend, lover, we don't know the nature of their relationship, that it's so overwhelming psychologically that basically he drops everything and goes into the wilderness in, in this uh, quest to, to find, by some means, immortality. Yeah? So I think the, the, the problem itself is just, it's, it's really so old, you know? Uh, it, maybe it's not necessarily confined to, 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 to sort of Christianity. Of course, Fyodorov is a deeply Christian thinker, you know, but he is not the only cosmist as well. And after the revolution, there is a whole generation of anarchist cosmists, people like Alexander Svetagor, uh, you know, uh, that actually that call themselves biocosmists, that completely reject this kind of Orthodox Christianity of Fyodorov and this insistence on God and stuff like that, and basically propose the same project but without uh, allusions or, or uh, referrals uh, referring to God. Uh, so, 
Yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. I had, yeah. I had a question to Anton. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned Krasne, there is a, a novel by Alexander Bogdanov, mm -hmm. who also somehow, uh, although he's an avant-garde uh, theoretician and a communist, he very much, uh, well, he dedicated a lot of time to cosmism, as well as Andrei Platonov, uh, a communist writer. So there were affinities and uh, there were parallels. But um, in this novel that Alexander Bogdanov uh, wrote, uh, immortality had already been achieved. achieved. By the Martians, uh, yeah, on Mars. Yeah, yeah. but somehow the, the one of the main protagonists, what is his name, I forgot? Leni. Uh, Leni. So, uh, immortality is uh, achieved. Uh, one of the main engineers of this immortality is himself immortal. Uh, he is a very conspicuous and successful uh, scholar, scientist. Uh, uh, so everything is um, everything is harmonious. But all of a sudden, he comes and chooses to commit suicide. So my question is, why do you think he has to commit suicide? It's a problem of overpopulation of Mars, if you read. Uh, 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 yeah, oh, oh, okay. yeah, basically the tragedy of Martians, they achieved socialism, they already built like a perfect communist society, everything works very well, they extend their lifespan, their medicine is groundbreaking, they don't have to die unless they want to. But uh, they basically, they overpopulate their planet and they're going to become extinct. Yeah, so this is the, the, the tragedy of, the, of socialism on Mars, which is why they kind of enter into a relationship with a person from Earth, from Russia. And I don't want to give away the story. You yeah, should read but, it. It's but, a great, uh, but, it's a great uh, book. But yeah. this, is, this is a very interesting point. So uh, if... <laughs> Uh, so, so, so then immortality cannot compete with this anthropic issue of extinction. And Ilyenkov, when he writes uh, another uh, socialist thinker, which is very important, uh, Marxist thinker, he writes a cosmology of spirit, where he starts with this inevitability of uh, entropy and generally extinction of our galaxy. So then extinction is inevitable, right? So... Um, well, for Elian Kof, yes, and then he kills himself. Yes, but then uh, Lenny also kills himself. The Martian, the fiction Martian in the Bogdanov, yeah. yeah. And Bogdanov kills himself too, uh, accidentally, yeah. But accidentally. Accidentally, but who knows, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been two hours. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah another Yeah, absolutely. This question always comes up, and sometimes it's phrases: Do you, re do you, would you resurrect Hitler or Stalin or, you know, some Nazis? Yeah, they yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard. I ca I can't. I think, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, just my understanding, what Fyodorov would say about this is that, yes, for him, resurrection has to include every single person who ever lived. And for some of the other cosmists, it's not only people, it's also every single animal, every single plant that ever lived, every single organism, including viruses and bacteria, and everything that has was alive once deserves to be alive forever. Yeah, it's a kind of a... Uh, absolute thing in a way, yeah? At the same time, I think the way Fyodorov imagines this resurrected society, and maybe this is one name that didn't come up in, in, in Katie's talk, which I think is very interesting in connection to this, which is Walter Benjamin, and uh, his kind of way of thinking about redemption and redeemed world, that maybe redeemed world is not very different physically from this world, except that everything is completely different, yeah? 
and in that re redeemed, resurrected society, maybe Hitler is not a danger to anyone because everybody is immortal. He cannot kill anybody, you know? Uh, yeah, something like that. Well, uh, Benjamin wouldn't imagine uh, still uh, everyone immortal, but he has this issue of retroactive, uh, retroactive pain. Uh, which is uh, unredeemable, and that's why you are constantly fixed on this pain of the lost love, and or the lost uh, phenomenon, or the, or the something that is precious, so, uh, on the loss of something that is precious. But another thing that I would like to maybe say when we were discussing this suicide of the scientist uh, in the overpopulated Marx. Um, I was always thinking when you were mentioning that everything should be resurrected, the bacteria, but what if certain subjectivity, there is Socrates and he says, no, I committed suicide, I took this hemlock and I don't want to be resurrected. I, it, it, it's my choice. This is one thing. Another thing, uh, the reason why Fyodorov, for instance, insists on this resurrection is that, you know, we as... Uh, the next generation after our parents, we are arrogant. So we somehow take over our parents and we somehow supersede our parents. So we go forth with our vital forces, whereas we leave them behind in their feebleness and in, in, in their mortality and in their, in their end. Whereas it should be otherwise, we should somehow turn back and we should bring this feebleness of our parents back and to make them strong. But another thing is that our parents may be out of love, would choose not to use our force for us to dedicate us to them. I mean, this is also very important, like mm -hmm. some sacrificial element coming from the ancestors who who would give us, I mean, it, it's also in Ilyenkov, like we know that we are extinct and I would die for the next generations. Uh, and uh, maybe this ancestral part, like fathers and mothers would, would give the next generation this sacrifice to give them the opportunity to live further. Yeah, I mean, this is dialectics, which is very difficult to resolve. I guess it would be up to the people uh, to decide once they're resurrected. Maybe they just want to go back to death. But the thing is, it's kind of an ethical thing. Like, we cannot be the curators of resurrection. We cannot say, well, this person deserves eternal life and that one doesn't. We're not Jesus, yeah? Uh, which is really what I find. Uh, it, maybe it's heretical of Fedorov, but it's wonderful that such a deeply religious Christian person does not... Uh, does not include this kind of moralizing element in his project of intern in his description of a project of eternal life. So it, you cannot use further of thinking as a way to control and regulate society because this is largely the the the, the, the function of these things about hell and heaven and eternal life and all of that. Not only in Christianity but in Buddhism, for example. If if you're bad then when you're reincarnated, you're reincarnated as some kind of a horrible insect and you're punished, yeah? So eternal life is used as a punishment to frighten you from certain socially destructive actions, you know? So further doesn't do anything like that. It's, it's kind of less everybody, you know? And yeah, perhaps later they can mm -hmm. decide what they want, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> oh, there's one, one last question. Thank you. 
Uh, is it a question for it's me? for you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to be responsible for sp spirituality. Well, it's a very good question, of course, but um, uh, I completely understand what you mean when you talk not about this f f institutional dogmas of uh, religion or church or any other confession which can be in Islam or uh, any other place, uh, which can be ritualistic and uh, absolutely maybe formal even, but at the same time something that in, uh, inspires you spiritually might not necessarily take place uh, in church as institution, but might bring you a divine feeling or feeling of inspiration or elevation or sublimation. Um, which is also kind of maybe for romantics, for instance, this would be a religious feeling. And there is a word for it, uh, like awe, the, the awe, oh, A-W-O-E. Yeah? Oh, yes, awe, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, A-W-E. Um, uh, yes, I would agree, but I mean, um, it's not that spirituality is separate from uh, religion, but religion itself um, somehow consists of these different uh, dimensions and um, uh, well I even had this uh, a little bit crazy idea that Christianity is not a religion uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes and that Christianity is even secular mm. uh, why because uh, I mean uh, uh, Christianity um, uh, uh, is developing precisely at as this um, uh, condition of constant questioning rather than uh, uh, guarantees or that regular religions provide. Like if you, um, if you press the button three times, uh, the magic occurs and this will happen. If you uh, cross yourself three times, uh, and this is, of course, religion, then uh, your wishes will be somehow coming true or whatever. So if you take it more as, a, an, ex as, a, as an expanded reason, uh, then probably you might say that um, there is no contradiction between uh, Christianity and uh, spirituality. But religion is something that to my mind, is something more ancient than Christianity. I think Christianity was invented to, to bid farewell to religion to a certain extent. Yes, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it needs more work and thinking. Thank you. Is there any? Yeah, just one more. Okay. Well, do you want to rephrase it? I can try to answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can because I don't have it here. But in the beginning, you were talking about religion. Uh, uh, but that question is not how religion came out of the institution, mm. which is the spirituality. And it's at the same time my thoughts of what everybody heard and said about the work of art, that the work of art is. Yeah, okay, sure. I think it's informative in the communication. It's something that, that you need to know when it is and what it is. Okay? I think it's been developed like that. Okay? And you could have this in the, like you go, you go to a museum and you, you uh, what is it? Uh, the, the, the painting that you like uh, a lot. And you, you, you could say like, I totally agree. I totally, this is called... Uh, Ideal.
Yes, I, I, I understood your question, yes. Yeah, but it, it's very good that you said that because it was precisely in Romanticism when art somehow substituted this something that you were getting in Revelation in religious institution, you were getting from an art piece and that's why art became, became the temple of this all uh, and artistic work became since Romanticism this uh, sublime uh, moment, right? Yes, you are right. Yes, with Tarkovsky you are totally right. I think we could dedicate to it uh, another session because in Russian uh, it's called <laughs> Duchovnost. You're forbidden from talking about Tarkovsky. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's too intimidating. <laughs> No, sure. I mean, it's 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 interesting that in film, basically, sound and music are kind of more important than the image, mm. which is really really strange. You know, that's has been kind of my realization over the last few years that this kind of production of immersive space, psychological space, is really achieved through sound part of the film than it is through through um, the uh, picture. Uh, so it is, it's super important, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm just very lucky to be friends with a, a, a really incredibly talented artist and musician in Berlin, Karsten Nikolai. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you maybe know his work, but he also usually goes under the name Alva Noto as, when, as a musician. Mm -hmm. And we've been collaborating since, basically since my first film. He either mixed existing music or wrote new original scores. But, but yeah, this is something incredibly important and yet not being a musician, I cannot r really uh, speak about it with too much knowledge, yeah. Uh, Well, it's actually, yeah, I think it also has a little bit to do with Karsten and his aesthetics and interest. And he is somebody that's really interested in synesthesia and the, the, the transference between, in between the senses. And incidentally, that synthesizer that Tarkovsky used, that's an ANS synthesizer, which translates images to sound. Yeah, so you could mm -hmm. play the keyboard, but you could also put in a, a, an abstract drawing and it will play it, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it's been, I heard recently that it's been so badly restored that it's basically ruined, yeah. Uh, but actually, Karsten was invited to compose uh, and perform something on it a few years ago and I've never, I asked him to, 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 to hear this recording and I, I haven't yet, yeah. But, but there are some, 
you know, because like also Thurman was such an important instrument around the time when a lot of cosmists ideas were very actively developed, you know, and this whole idea of, of manipulating something without touch, using your biofield, your bioelectricity to uh, interact with an inanimate object, yes, uh, s s there is some kind of not only aesthetic sensibility that runs through all of this experimentation and modernist music and early electronic music, but it, it does have certain kind of mystical or spiritual or whatever you want to say mm -hmm. connotations, yeah? Uh, like for example, uh, uh, a contemporary Thurman player that I met in Japan who is a really kind of incredible person, uh, he was one of the best Thurman players and had a stroke, so half of his body is paralyzed and of course to play Thurman you need two hands. So as he started recovering slowly and playing again, he said it, he had a very strange feeling that he was not playing the instrument, but the instrument was scanning his body and basically kind of expressing the condition of his body and his Ill illness in as, as sounds, yeah? So this relationship, who plays who and who scans who, you know, it, it becomes very confusing uh, in a wonderful way, you know? Um, yeah, so that's a roundabout non-answer <laughs> to a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you to everyone present. Thank you a lot to Professor um, and Dean of uh, Porto uh, Faculty of Fine Arts, Professor Luisa, uh, Lucia Matsch. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for Anton, Katie Shukrov. Thank you, everyone.